Um, thank you for coming to our session. Uh, my name is James Thomas. Um, I'm Professor of Social Research and Policy at the Epicenter, which is modestly named and part of UCL in London now. And this is... I'm uh, Ruth Garside. I'm a senior lecturer at uh, the European Centre for Environment and Human Health, which is part of the University of Exeter, but in the Wild West campus down in Georgia. And both Ruth and I spend um, quite a lot of our time um, doing systematic reviews to inform decision making and so we um, spend quite a lot of our time thinking about how to do them as well. So this is not just our thinking of course, there's an awful lot of other people in the field that are thinking about this but um, as our funders would no want, want us to say, um, the views are our own and not necessarily those who have funded us or our centres. Um, so we're not going to talk at you for 90 minutes, you might be glad to know. Um, we're going to obviously talk a little bit. Uh, we're going to think about what systematic reviews are, um, and in particular, we're going to think about methods for qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, and then we also want to enable you to have some time to think about some of these issues as well. So we'd like it to be quite interactive, as interactive as you like in that we're going to be raising some issues, but if there's anything which is unclear or anything which um, you'd like to ask us questions, just do feel free to interrupt us at any particular point. Um, it doesn't need to be a monologue. Um, we're going to think about, as well as some of the practicalities of what the methods are, some of the theories around what evidence synthesis is and what it means to be bringing together um, diverse research studies, as, as it sometimes happens. And we're going to finally think around um, some of the newer developments around how we can have confidence and thinking about confidence and what that means in terms of evidence synthesis. So we've got a rough timeline here, which I suppose the only thing that's going to be completely reliable about it is that we will finish more or less then, and we will start more or less at the beginning, and we'll do these things more or less in that order as we go through them. So essentially we're going to raise some issues in a presentation, we've got some papers for you to look at, we've got some a feedback session to be, to be had, and we've got more discussion and presentation to come after that. So, may as well start at the beginning. So, so what are systematic reviews? Um, yeah, what are systematic reviews? Um, who would like to throw, throw some definitions out into the room? Who knows what a systematic review is? Synthesising the kind of weight of evidence around a particular theme. <coughs> so synthesising, so bringing together, yeah. and then you've got the concept about weight of evidence. So we're, we're, we're sort of so we're coming to some kind of judgement about what the evidence has to say about something. Anyone else? Yeah. From the vast literature deciding what is relevant and what is not relevant, to the specific point you want to make around the systematic review. Right, so there's, a, there's an issue around the boundaries that you put around review, being clear about why you include something and why you don't include something. Yep. And doing that through a clear process, so you outline the steps that you take in the decision that you're going to go through. Yeah, so you're getting at the systematic bit of the systematic review there, aren't you? Yeah, so there's, there's something about having a method. Uh, a, so we've got something about having a method, being clear about what you're doing and why, about the boundaries around the review, um, the fact that we're wanting to bring together evidence, bring together research studies, whatever we're doing, but it's, it's, it's not just about listing them. There's, there's this element of synthesis, we're actually drawing, drawing things together and building something new. Um, and there was one other issue which has slipped my mind, but it'll probably come back to me. What somebody else mentioned. No, nope. but I think that's probably a, a pretty good summary of what we think of systematic reviews might be. So one definition is around using structured approaches to identifying, including quality appraising. Interesting concept, in, in, especially in the concept of, in the context of qualitative research. Um, Synthesising research evidence about a given phenomenon. So quite a lot of what we've raised is already in that definition being clear about what we've done and why we've done it. And there are different routes for what we now know as a systematic reviews, but certainly sort of a major component of this now 
is that we're bringing together research in order to inform decision making. So it's at that, so that frontier between research and, and practice or, or, or a decision making context. And quite a lot of what we're having to do when we're thinking about doing a, a systematic review or synthesizing evidence is to think about how the research evidence might speak to a given decision making context. And it's not always exactly clear what the relationship should be. Okay, so that's systematic reviews in general. I think a little bit about systematic reviews of qualitative research. So, actually, should have had a um, had an animation on that one. So why, why should we synthesize qualitative research? I'll go back just before um, everyone reads the whole slides. What, what, what do you think the value is, might be in terms of why we might want to synthesize qualitative research in particular? Let's see how far people manage to scan down the slide before it's actually gives a richer account of the particular phenomenon. So you might have broad based quantitative studies giving you directions and measurements, yeah. but qualitative will give some sort of depth of analysis as to why that can work as it is. You raised lots of things there. So there's depth of analysis, but you also raised the why, which is, is an important point. So you know, there's, there's the um, the element that the quantitative evidence might tell you something around sort of like the magnitude of an effect, if that's what we're looking at, and its precision, but won't actually tell you very much about the why. And that's one of the things that yeah, we certainly look qualitative research to do. There's yeah, there's one here, and then go on. Sorry? Is it to identify key themes that you can then uh, apply in your own research? You know, looking at the, the state of the, the art in that area and identifying common themes? Yeah, I and mean, I mean, you, you've raised an important point there as well in that doing a systematic review and evidence synthesis doesn't necessarily mean that it's for a particular decision. The decision in what you've raised there is, is what shall I look at next? And so, you know, taking stock about what we know about a given phenomenon or given phenomena um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a really useful and important element of why we do evidence synthesis. Yeah. I guess there is some kind of doubt because most of the systematic reviews refer to quantitative um, uh, research. Uh, so maybe there's a gap on uh, uh, in the, uh, approaching a phenomenon on the qualitative perspective and seeing what is there. Yeah, certainly. I mean, a lot of the methods and a lot of the systematic views that you see will be more focused on the quantitative. Though that, that balance is changing. Yeah. And I think it also helps with uh, uh, reducing waste by, because you have a set of criteria and you choose the material against this set of criteria. So there are materials that you may not include because they don't meet the requirements that you already have. So it helps to reduce the waste and effort in time and all these things when you put the yeah, I mean, reducing research waste. There's, um, there's, there's, there's lots of being talked about that at the moment. But certainly, um, you know, in the early days of doing systematic reviews, I remember going to talk to um, commissioners of research and policy makers. And the systematic reviews were very narrow at times. And they were just saying, well, we know lots more about this problem than just this. But wh why, why don't we use it? And so, I mean, one, one of the answers to that has been to sort of develop ways of looking at sort of a wider range of evidence than was looked at at the, origin, at the beginning. And you're quite right, yeah, otherwise you are wasting an awful lot of effort, an awful lot of knowledge, which, which still does go on. Okay, great. So, I think we've probably covered quite a lot of this. Um, certainly we've got the waste in here. Um, we've got a little bit, we've got a slightly different language here, but we talked about the why, generating ex explanations, um, higher order conceptualization of a, of a, of a phenomenon potentially, um, giving us breadth, and thinking about the transferability of what research has to say. And I think that's one of the key ways in which qualitative um, syntheses are, are being used. I mean, the, the, a, a, a review with a meta-analysis or meta-regression or that kind of analysis will be using um, a whole sort of epistemology around statistical inference to be able to be making claims as to why a given uh, intervention 
or a given phenomenon might be, you know, we might be observing a particular size of effect. And the implication there is because of the, the way that statistical inference is, is um, aimed to work, um, what we're wanting to be able to do then is on the basis of statistical estimation to be able to say what the likely effect will be in our inference population. And that's all based around properties of the normal distribution and, and sort of known statistical um, rules. The way that you're thinking about inference in the context of qualitative synthesis is quite different in that we're, we're getting, at, um, getting at the why, for sure. We're, we're thinking around, well, th this worked here because we think this was the case. And then that helps us to think through why it might be transferable to another situation. So the, the inferential um, basis of the claims that we're making are quite different. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say one's better or worse than another. They're just, they are utterly different ways of, of thinking about um, inference and utterly different ways about thinking about why we know X in this context might mean that we will see X or Y in another. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to cover all these in more detail because I've got a feeling I'm taking much longer over this than I intended. So I'm going to move us straight on now to thinking about the range of methods um, and if, if you've looked at the range of methods and the range of labels for methods that are available for doing qualitative synthesis, there are quite a lot. Uh, and this, this word Wordle was put together years ago, um, and I don't think actually there are all that many more now. But you can see there are, there are terms like metroethnography, there's thematic synthesis in there, um, you can see noblet and hair there, which refers to metroethnography. We've got grounded theory. Um, ecological triangulation will be in there somewhere, meta-narrative review, meta-theory, grounded theory, all sorts of, of terms. And one of the, the questions that we had a few years ago is, well, why have we got all these, all these methods? Um, do we need all these methods? And are they, doing, are they doing the same or different things? So we did a little methodological study um, where we searched for methodological papers and we identified at the time nine distinct methods for synthesis. And here they are, here are the labels. Um, I won't go through them in detail because um, we want to do other things um, this morning. But essentially what we did was we then looked across these different methods. We looked at their epistemology. We looked at how they approached quality assessment, the appraisal, how reliable they assessed studies to be. We looked at their attitudes to problematizing the literature, which, um, this was like the um, ontological and the epistemological base that, that people were coming from when they did their reviews. Um, their, their stance towards a review question was quite interesting because when you're looking at the systematic review literature, there's a lot of emphasis put on the review <coughs> question. Um, and some people will sort of want a very narrow, sharply defined review question, whereas others will say, well, actually, sometimes the act of sort of looking at the literature helps us refine what the question is in the first place. So there's, there's quite a diversity of views on that. Um, the, 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 sort of like the stance towards how similar or different included studies might be, um, heterogeneity, um, and I'll, I'll talk more about, about these in a second. So, falling into very, very broad camps here, and I really am talking broad camps here, it's, it's very difficult to pigeonhole methods. We felt that they fell broadly into this idealist and realist camps. So a realist perspective, where we're wanting to, where essentially people are saying, um, we're making claims about a real world, whether it's sort of, and this, this, this is, isn't necessarily sort of like a positivist um, conceptualization of, of real, but it, this, is, this is where we're, we're saying that there is a world out there which we can have some kind of knowledge of. Um, it may be imperfect because we're observing it through imperfect media. media. Um, however, we, we do attest that we can, we can know something about a world that's there, is real, um, and we can mediate between different perspectives. Of it, which, which is quite, quite an important aspect of, of, these, of these methods. And what we find when we're, we're, we've got methods which are taking that particular approach is that they're a little bit more sort of practical in that they're trying to answer a question which has got a specific decision-making context. So they're, they're trying to say, well, decision-maker, this will help you make a real decision. Um, they've got a range of different data analyzed with, with a range of different methods. Um, and 
they've got a, a, a sort of a variety of approaches to identifying the literature. Some will have a very linear approach, quite a protocol-driven um, way of doing reviewing. So they'll say, this is, this, this is, I know right at the very beginning what the parameters of my review are. I can specify them. I can go and find that literature. I can bring it back. And I don't need to think about sort of finding literature anymore. I've, I've kind of job's done there. Whereas others would be saying, uh, well, I'm going to have an initial search of the literature, but actually once I've had a look at that, um, additional leads might then, uh, then strike, strike me or strike me or strike the team, and then we'll go off and we'll have another search, and we'll bring some more literature in, and then we'll bring some more literature in. And so it's quite iterative, this process of, of looking at the literature, seeing what it says, and then thinking about actually where, where we should also be looking next. And also then the issue around quality assessment of study methods. This, this is quite a, quite a sharp um, delineation, really, where the attitude towards quality assessment in these types of qualitative reviews um, really have taken their lead from more quantitative reviews. And they're saying, my confidence in the findings of these reviews is really um, dependent on how well the research was carried out. So they look at the methods which we use to carry out the research, and they say, well, my, my confidence in its findings is really rooted in, in, in the methodological rigour within which the research was conducted. And that, I'll, I'll lead straight into idealist approaches on that, because on um, the assessment of the quality in, in, in these approaches, I've got content is greater than method. What they're saying is that actually more important than the methods that we use to carry out the study is the content, the, the findings of the study, whether are the findings salient, are, are they rich, um, do they help me with my decision-making context if that's what it is, or do they help me understand the phenomena better? So it's much more around the contribution that the findings make to the synthesis, and less important are the methods which we use to generate those findings. Um, the idealist approach, as you might expect, um, is, a, is, is, is around more around constructing and understanding different perspectives of the world. So it's exploring, constructing ideas um, and a range of perspectives. Often a lot of these um, types of review don't aim to sort of bring everything together and say this is sort of my coherent view of the world. What they're wanting to do is to be able to explain why people understand things differently and, or how people understand particular phenomena differently. It's all around sort of that understanding of different, different perspectives. Um, and for these sorts of review, you definitely find that there's a lot more iterative searching, but it's very rare that you'll just do one round of searching. You'll, you'll, you'll have one battery studies, and then you'll go off and you'll search and you'll find some more, and you'll, you'll gradually um, sort of, well, you'll gradually run out of time if you do it too much, as I've seen some reviews do, but you, you, you gradually end up with a, with a sort of like a rich pool of studies, is the, is the aim, which, um, which you might not have been able to sort of imagine at the very beginning, which is, you know, part of the point that the, the, the process is, is exploratory. And the findings from these types of reviews are much less sort of directly aimed at influencing a particular decision. They're, they're aimed at sort of influencing how people might think about a given phenomenon. Um, one of the reviews that we did uh, in this type of light, really, we did for the obesity team years ago at the Department of Health. And it wasn't to influence any particular policy. What it was, it was to give them a sense of what the sort of like the social lives of children and young people were in relation to obesity, body size, shape and weight. And the team said at the time, they said, well, you know, this didn't actually, we can't point to a particular decision where we say, we did this because you said we'd get this if we did that. It was much more around helping them think through the potential impacts of particular policy implementation decisions they were making. And I, th I think we, we, one of the things I often say is that policy making is, is a kind of misnomer in that an awful lot of policy making work is actually policy implementation. So they were thinking through things like how to communicate um, the National Child Measurement Programme results to parents and that kind of thing, and what sort of impacts different ways of communication might have on the social lives of children at school. It was all, it, and it just helps you think through some of those issues, and it doesn't actually have a direct bearing necessarily on any one particular decision. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a flavour of the different 
types of review that we, or Tim Grant, the method that we, we came across. Operationally, we found that the methods were quite similar, but some of these underlying principles and the aims and objectives were quite different. Um, and the, the paper's up on the BMC Medical Research Methodology website, so you can just download it. It's open access. Am I still going? Oh. Well, I am. Sorry? You're well over. Um, do it quickly. I'll do it very fast. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll just raise this as, as a useful heuristic, or a useful way of thinking about um, what we're doing when we're doing a synthesis. Um, the qualitative quantitative binary divides sometimes is not particularly helpful. Um, and what we find is a little bit more useful in terms of thinking about what we're doing in a synthesis, not necessarily a whole review, because reviews have got many, many different components, but when we're bringing studies together, are we thinking about aggregation or configuration? Aggregation in a synthesis, in a review, is around identifying similarity. So we're identifying similar concepts, we're identifying similar populations, might be similar intervention. And the point here is to gain greater confidence because we're finding the same thing, essentially. That's the um, sort of underlying theory there. Um, you see that particularly in a meta-analysis, for example, where you're, you're looking at the same phenomenon, the same intervention, the same population. You pile them all up, and what that gives you is greater confidence in the magnitude of an effect and its precision. So the point estimate and the confidence intervals around it. And we can contrast that with configuration, where what we're wanting to do is look at how the research pieces together in order to provide an overarching picture. So for the aggregation, we had a pile of stones at the turn. For configuration here, we've got um, a picture of mosaic, where what we do is we look at how each individual um, study contributes to our understanding of the phenomena as a, as a whole. And most reviews will have some aggregation and some configuration. It doesn't map neatly against qualitative or quantitative at all. But it's quite helpful in sort of thinking that for aggregation, what we're wanting is similarity. Whereas for configuration, if you're wanting to sort of understand why things differ from one another, you actually look for, you, you need difference, you need heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is helpful. It's often described in systematic review textbooks as being unhelpful. We actually really like heterogeneity because it helps us to understand why you see different um, effects in different contexts and people have different understandings. So it's very useful for us. And I won't talk to that. Shall I let you go? Yes, Sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, James has talked about some of the, the background and the theory of um, systematic reviews. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the practicalities of what you're doing. Um, and this um, diagram is really to think about different sorts of findings in qualitative research. So um, from the more exploratory and descriptive findings to the more um, interpretative. So. Uh, thematic surveys are often quite close to the data so when you're analyzing you might just be it's more aggregative if you like piling things up that are very similar in nature and giving them a descriptive label um, and then the findings may become more and more transformed the more conceptual you become about them and the more theoretical you become about them and um, Sandilovsky and Barossa talk about this in terms of where they see qualitative research sitting um, and also um, where qualitative evidence synthesis might sit so that you need to have some organization of data in order to do qualitative evidence synthesis and again there will be different levels of transformation from the data that you've got so across the different methods um, which James talked about, there are a number of different influences about which way you might go, which synthesis method you might use. Some of it is um, about you and your team, your experience, the amount of time you've got, what the review's for and so on. And some of it might be about the nature of the evidence that you identify, and that's what we're gonna look at a little bit now. But before we get there, it's worth just having a quick think about what qualitative data looks like in the context of a qualitative evidence synthesis. If you've done a series of interviews, it's usually fairly obvious what, what your data is. It's your transcripts, and you might also have some notes about what you've done. It might be slightly less obvious when what you're working with is something like the paper that you've got. This is a write-up of research and this is your raw material if you're going to do a qualitative evidence synthesis. So 
On the one hand, you'll have primary data. You'll have quotes from people. Um, this is taken from uh, a study around the impact of having gardens for people um, in care homes with dementia. And you get these kinds of quotes which form part of your data. But when you're looking at this kind of data, which is the report, it's helpful perhaps to think of different levels of interpretation. So your data might be those quotes, everyday ways of making sense of the world, and they're sometimes called first-order first constructs or first-order um, concepts. And then you also have a next layer of data, which is the social scientist or um, res other researchers interpretation of the so-called common sense world. So you've got um, descriptors, concepts, theories, which come from the researcher rather than from the people who you're speaking to. And then it's been proposed that as a reviewer, you are maybe producing third order constructs. So you're in another layer of interpretation from these two <coughs> levels. Now some people say these are still just second order constructs because they're still reviewers making sense of of data, but it's perhaps helpful to think of those different levels of types of information. So this is a mock-up taken from a, a review done around preventing cardiovascular disease. And these rows are taken from two separate research papers. So in the left-hand column, you've got a quote. Oh, can I have the yeah. point? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so this um, first column is the quotes that are reported in the paper. These are things that people say, and they're about different sorts of ways that people receive information about changing behaviour so that they can try and prevent cardiovascular disease. This second um, column shows how the original researchers interpreted that information. So um, this one was about food sampling, and the researcher's interpretation was around practical demonstrations having more impact. This one was talking about a person, and the interpretation is that the, this sort of champion for um, cardiovascular disease prevention um, allowed personalized information. The, reviewer brought these two findings together under this heading, that actually both of these were more about personalised support and relationship building. And those were the, so it wasn't necessarily that it was food sampling or a mentor, it was doing something which allowed there to be a relationship developing and personalised support. So that sort of shows you the way that you might build up um, a qualitative synthesis. And so this final one is the kind of synthesised finding. Um, I mean, obviously, this is just two examples. There'd be more um, papers in the synthesis. So we know that there's lots of different outputs from qualitative research, and the same is true for uh, research. So they might be things like defining new concepts, describing a phenomenon, creating a new typology, describing processes, developing theories or developing strategies. So there's quite a lot of different sorts of data that you might be trying to bring together in your qualitative evidence synthesis. And you might also be trying to produce these kinds of findings. Are you trying to provide a rich, detailed description of a phenomenon? Or are you actually trying to develop some broader, more all-encompassing uh, theory? And that will depend on your approach, your needs, and your methods. So the kinds of information you see in a paper might be text, which are quotes or author analysis, tables, um, conceptual figures, images, and so on. If you have to look for findings, they're in lots of different places and lots of different ways. So this is taken uh, from a paper about access to health care for older women in Bangladesh. And Typically, when you look at the findings section of this sort of paper, you have a heading that tells you you've got findings or results, and you've got sections in there. So most of your findings will be in the section called findings, but not all of them. And you'll have um, some findings which are almost buried in that um, picture. So if you look at this, 
you can see there's findings, but there's also headings, and you might expect the main findings to be under subheaders. But actually, when you look at it, there's, a, there's an almost hidden sentence at the beginning which describes the overarching conclusions. The overarching conclusions of this study were about um, healthcare se seeking for older women in rural Bangladesh being in a socially excluded space. And that was the kind of key finding. But it's not necessarily easy to locate that. Um, and it goes on to describe the different um, elements that contribute to that overarching finding. And then those show up as subheaders or subthemes throughout. So you've got exclusionary social practices, and the first line is almost a kind of sub-theme of that. Older women's health is treated as the least important in the family. Um, and then the, another one further down, which is a, um, a sub-theme of the exclusionary social practices, is that other people decide for you, you don't have autonomy. Um, so you can start to build up a picture of what the research findings look like. And then you also have um, quotes so this here is a quote from the original data set, which is also a kind of finding. So these are your first order interpretations, how people make sense of their world. And these bits of data um, are the researchers' interpretations and the researchers' labels for those interpretations. But also elsewhere, there's a linking of those findings to broader social theory. So there's a section in the <coughs> paper about stigma and the nature of stigma, as you might expect, which is also a finding of this paper, although it's drawn from outside a broader um, theoretical framework. And the other thing to realize is that sometimes there's information that's really important that is not in the finding section. So this paper has a theoretical perspective which frames the, the author's researcher's perspective, which is actually at the end of the introduction section. But that's also part, quite important framing for you to understand where the researchers are coming from and how they produce their second order interpretations. And then finally, this section, which is in the discussion, is an interpretation in terms of um, government practices. So that you can see that the information is quite complex across the paper. It's certainly more complex than simply having a transcript from, a, from an interview. So each of you have got a paper, and I know you've only just seen it because we got paranoid about um, copyright <laughs> before we uploaded it onto the site. But what I'd really like you to do just for, for 10 minutes or so is to have a look at the paper. And there are, there are two different papers, one's by Chapel and one's by O'Flynn and, and Britain. You've all only got one, but hopefully you've got the same one as the person sitting next to you. It's just to have a look and perhaps start with the findings section and just see if you can identify some of the first order or second order uh, constructs that are in that paper and how they are presented in that particular one. There you go. So um, once, you've, once you've identified some findings, then you have the chance to synthesize them. So um, James is going to introduce some of the approaches about what you ne what, now you've identified the findings, how, how would you synthesize them? Now we're going to just um, give you a couple of short worked examples of two approaches which are quite common. There's one thematic synthesis, which draws very heavily on thematic analysis of primary research. If you've done that, then this is very similar. Um, and then there's meta-ethnography, which Ruth is going to take us through in a minute. So I'll, I'll just take us through thematic synthesis really quite, with a, quite a high level. Um, as I've said, it draws heavily on thematic analysis from primary qualitative research. Um, and when we sort of first started working on, on this, of this, like the synthesis of um, qualitative data in reviews, we, were, um, we wanted some way in which, we, which gave us some confidence that what we were finding, what we were, the conclusions we were drawing, were rooted in the, the papers that we um, were reading. And we wanted to be able to demonstrate that link to people who wanted to query. I mean, that, that's one of the sort of principles around 
systematic reviewing and evidence synthesis is sort of aiming for some, as much transparency as possible. And we were sort of trying to think how we, how we were transparent about what we were doing in the synthesis and how we could account for what we came up with in terms of the papers. So we use, um, we use NVivo, I mean, there are lots of different qualitative um, analysis packages that you can use, but we essentially treated the papers as data. So if you've done interviews, for example, yourselves, um, or if you've seen interview transcripts, so essentially <coughs> we treated them like a transcript. It's like a research transcript. It's a, it's a transcript of a research study rather than a transcript of, a, of an interview. And we then would, would use line-by-line -line coding, so we would literally sort of have a, have, a, have a tool where we would have the paper in front of us, we would highlight sections of it and, and encapsulate them in, in codes and themes. And um, I, the, begin, to begin with, what we think of really as doing is a sort of like a data reduction exercise where we're just trying to say this sentence is about this. And we sort of have a code which sort of encapsulates what a particular sentence is about. Um, and then, so we, we go through one paper, basically sort of just, just ge generating a set of codes. Then when we get to the next paper, we've kind of actually then started the synthesis, because then what we're doing is we're thinking about, again, highlighting sentences and, and adding codes against them, but we've already got a set of codes from one study. So we're, we're, we're sort of thinking all of the time whether or not a particular concept that we've coded actually translates between the studies. And um, this, 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 this uh, sort of a key, key concept in, that, in synthesis of qualitative evidence is translation. It's, it's this idea of whether or not we can say with um, confidence that a, a particular concept is, is, is expressed possibly in different ways, but between different papers. And so that, that's part of what our, our sort of approach to line by line to coding helps us to do. It helps us to be quite transparent and clear within the team and beyond if someone else wants to come and look at our data in terms of how we've done that act of translation. Because we can say, well, we've got a code here, which as, as you get more um, text coded according to something, it becomes, you know, it becomes a theme. Um, we can define that theme and we can say, well, that's based on all of this text here. And so we can we can we can we can have quite a good and close match between the themes and the and the text on which they're based. We start off, as as the slide says here, we start off being quite descriptive, and then we build up to something that's just more conceptual. And the way that we do that usually is is we think of um, doing a synthesis in two stages. We do a descriptive synthesis, which is around the translation of concepts between one paper and one study and another, and an understanding of where they may differ, where some, because sometimes obviously people don't say exactly the same things, so they disagree with one another. So what we also want to be able to do is have some account of why people say different things and understand things in different ways. And then, what we then, have a, we then do is we think about our review question, and we say, well, okay, so in terms of what we're wanting to know, what does this tell us? And the, when, when we start pushing the um, evidence in, to answer a specific question, then we start having to, to, to sort of to develop high-level concepts and start to explain, to, to start to generate explanations. So there are various reports that have used thematic synthesis. This is um, one of the first that we did many years ago now. Um, and what I wanted to highlight here, as well as the, sort of like the, the fact that we used a, a qualitative method of synthesis was also the way in which you can do a mixed methods review where you can use the qualitative synthesis as a way of understanding what's going on in a quantitative synthesis. So in this review it was all about um, children's, um, well it was, it was about promoting fruit and vegetable consumption to children and we had two sets of studies once we'd, we'd mapped research literature, we'd identified our research literature, we found that we had what we called view studies, which were studies about the children's perspectives and experiences and their understandings of healthy eating. And we had trials, which were controlled trials, where people had evaluated the impact of interventions which were aimed to increase fruit and vegetable consumption. And what we did was we did a thematic synthesis, a qualitative synthesis of the qualitative studies, which generated theories as to what might be a good approach to promoting fruit and veg consumption among children. And then we looked to see which of those theories had been tested in the trial literature. And that, that I'll, I'll, I've got a slide on that coming up, so I'll take you to that. So as I've just mentioned, really, we've got this structure of doing a thematic synthesis where we're thinking about coding text line by line in order to be quite disciplined about our reading of the papers and what we're taking from the paper. 
um, we develop these descriptive themes and then we generate analytical themes, which in this case we're thinking about, okay, so we've done this descriptive analysis, what are the implications here for interventions? What would, might, in, in terms of the children's understandings of the world, what might help them to eat more healthily or at least, at least eat fruit and vegetables? So I've talked to you through most of that, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'll just take you through what we called the cross-study synthesis, the way that we brought the two sets of studies together. We had recommendations coming out of the, um, the qualitative synthesis, the thematic synthesis, which we put down on the left here. This is just part of it. So it was, there was a much longer list of recommendations. So one of them was don't promote fruit and vegetables in the same way. The children have been saying quite clearly that um, they like fruits, didn't like vegetables, saw them in quite different contexts. They, they, they're just different. Some are cooked, some aren't. They're, but if you look at all the interventions here, we look for interventions which actually took account of the fact that children saw fruits and vegetables as being quite different. Adults didn't see them that way at all. They were all about promoting the five a day, basically telling children fruit and veg are the same thing, which was potentially harmful, obviously, because the, the children were saying, well, we, we, you know, we're, you're pushing it an open door in terms of particular fruits, but in terms of vegetables, yeah, that's, that's, that's another story. Um, we did, we had one of the things that children would emphasise was taste over health, particularly over future health. Future health messages just had no salience for children aged seven, for example. You know, what, what does that mean? I mean the, the concept of the future is difficult enough, let alone future and health. And you know that, that's that's a that's a grown-up problem. And yet, all of these interventions about eat this, it's good for you. So children could get, understand the fact that something was healthy. They could repeat that back to you. But in terms of that meaning something in terms of why that should impact on decision, just had no salience. So one of the findings was around just forget health messages, talk about fruits and vegetables in terms of their taste. Um, and some some had done that. And then we could do a sort of a fairly standard subgroup analysis where we were able to subgroup studies which did do what the children who were suggesting might be a good idea um, against those that didn't. And this is one on um, health messages. We did quite a few of these. So I'll, I'll stop there in terms of this method. What I wanted to introduce you to was the, sort of like the transparency angle around being clear about where the findings have come from and also the way in which you can get different sets of st quite different studies to talk to one another and inform one another because there, there, there are subgroup analysis we did here which we couldn't have imagined that we'd have done beforehand we, we, we wouldn't have thought of some of the things that were in those uh, those papers from the children so over to Ruth for the okay so that's a quick rundown of what a um what are you talking about? <laughs> thematic <laughs> synthesis looks like. I'm going to just give you a quick overview um, about metaethnography, which you'll see shares shares similarities but some differences. So, um, metaethnography has been developed from this 1988 book by Noblet and Hare, um, but it kind of predates the systematic review and qualitative evidence synthesis interest. So, in fact, um, Noblet has says he's amazed that his method has been adopted in systematic reviews of qualitative research. And this book doesn't talk to any other stage of a systematic review. It doesn't talk about um, searching or quality appraisal or selecting papers, all the other sort of front end bits of a systematic review. It really does deal primarily with what you do with the data once you've got it. And uh, this paper um, from 2002 from Britain and colleagues was really the first attempt some many years later to try and use a metaethnography with existing published research. And this is quite um, a useful example if you're interested because it's a worked example of how to work through the steps and stages of doing um, a metaethnography. So one of the things um, about this paper is that it is explicitly interpretative. So it's much more on the configurative, interpretative end of the scale rather than the aggregative. And um, it looks to create new concepts <coughs> or to employ <coughs> concepts um, found in, the, in some of your papers to create a whole understanding. 
and it uses as its method um, an approach it refers to as translation. But this translation is at the conceptual level. So you're translating interpretations into each other, less working with the first order um, construct. So it's one of the few methods that explicitly asks you to work with existing researcher interpretations rather than, I mean, many synthesis methods kind of conflate the type, the quotes, the themes, and the, the interpretations. This is explicit about wanting to work at the conceptual level. So there are three types of translation described in that original meta-ethnography book. The first is um, reciprocal translation. So each um, construct is examined from one paper across the other papers. And you look at it and you say, this construct is like or unlike these other constructs in these different ways. And you try and draw between the papers where um, papers and authors are referring to similar things. And you can say that this time I can translate them into a single construct. And so you proceed iteratively across the different papers. And um, I think perhaps because they're ethnographers, they also talk about um, ideas, not just con co concepts and themes, but also metaphors in writing and translating metaphors across each other to try and um, uh, reduce explanations in a way that doesn't lose meaning. So it's been described as sort of a similar approach to constant comparison. You're, looking, you're trying to interpret the ideas in terms of each other across the different papers, looking for similarities, contradictions, and overlaps. And it also um, asks you to think about explanatory power. So does one idea actually encompass several others? So you're gradually building up this idea of reducing um, a construct into a more powerful explanation which actually can incorporate other papers and in that way you can translate them under it. So it very much values this third order construct um, idea. So the reviewer interpretation of the evidence base is what's important. And it's been suggested that you can use different tools. I mean people do still use coding but also to think about organising con concepts in different ways to try and juxtapose them and understand them in terms of each other. And that is sort of research, uh, researcher choice, really, with the ways that work for you in terms of mind maps or tabulations or colour coding ideas and so on. All those approaches are um, recommended. So the second um, type of translation that uh, Noblet and Hare talk about is refutational translation. And this specifically is looking for patterns which, which are opposite to those in the other papers. And particularly where there are opposing um, patterns which are difficult to interpret in terms of other circumstances. I mean, obviously, you might find opposing ideas in different papers, but you can also create an explanation um, for why those differences occur, in which case you might say they are talking about similar things because you've got an explanation that encom encompasses both. But this is particularly looking for counter-arguments within the data. And then um, finally, there's a line of argument. And this is where you can build up, use the building blocks of explanations to create an overall, what can we say about the whole? And this might be the development of a new model or a new um, theory through the synthesis. And so people who are producing new conceptual frameworks or new conceptual models, for example, which might be textual or figurative, are tra trying to do this line of argument to bring together um, more than one idea. So um, we don't have a massive amount of time left, but I wonder, just thinking about those two different approaches, thematic analysis and metaethnography. What, would, what do you think you could do with the sort of data you have in your paper? I mean, maybe just take a moment to talk to the person next to you about where you think you could go with the kind of information that you have. There are other methods, and just to illustrate one that's sort of far to the right-hand end of the, um, the aggregative is over here and the interpretive constructionist is over here. This is further over, and this is called meta-study based on this book by Patterson and colleagues. 
And this is a complex approach, which again tries to break down our understandings of different schools of thought. So it looks at analysing theory, methods, and findings. And the synthesis is the way of thinking how um, a phenomenon has been thought about and how different understandings have been created through the interaction between theory and method. Um, and again, it's very much a constructionist um, approach where you take the primary qualitative research, you look at the findings and do a metadata analysis, you look at the methods and do a meta method, and you look at the theoretical and analytical fine, uh, frameworks and do a meta theory and then try and bring it together. So it's very much trying to understand how different schools of thought, particularly different theoretical and conceptual um, schools, have led to particular understandings of a phenomenon. And um, in terms of thinking about the meta-method stuff, it's also thinking about how particular sorts of findings are created through the application of method. And James was saying about the aggregative findings, that we assume that if we find more similar stuff, we're building up a stronger picture of it. This is very much the reverse. This is very much saying, well, if you've got a load of studies which are all being done by nurses using a phenomenological approach and in interviews, the fact that you find similar things isn't that surprising, because why wouldn't they? You know, what's really interesting is if you've got someone over here doing an ethnography from a completely different um, theoretical background who's finding something different or even something similar, and then that's something which you could then get excited about. So it's a really different way of understanding how qualitative research is undertaken and how qualitative findings are produced. But again, it's very much about a critical interpretation of what's out there. And it's an attempt to try and build a new theoretical framework which can try and accommodate a broad range of understandings. Um, so I, I, we are sort of running out of time. So I really just wanted to flag that as an alternative method to show you that there's this you know, long um, variety, this long chain of different approaches which move from this um, generating um, theory, which is the configuring stuff where meta-ethnography and meta-theory sit, and the more aggregative stuff. I mean, there is something called ag aggregative synthesis, which is much more just about piling up and describing. And then, um, finally, also just to flag to you that Policymakers are always really interested about how much confidence they should have in the findings of research. And this has been a, an issue for quantitative systematic reviews for a while, and there's been quite well established methods um, through a system called GRADE, where people can rate, you know, rate my finding. How good is it? And um, so we've recently started to think about tools for trying to do something similar for qualitative research findings. And, um, there's something called the Circle Approach, and there's a website which is circle.org where you can find a lot more information. There's a paper which looks at each finding coming out of a qualitative synthesis and tries to say about that finding, you know, how, how sure are we this is a good representation of the phenomenon under question. And it tries to take into account the method methodological limitations in the papers producing the finding, the coherence, the relevance. Um, of the finding and the adequacy of the data. I don't really have any time to do anything other than flag this up, um, but this is, uh, I suppose, increasingly being used, isn't it? And the first time it was used was through a WHA project, so big policymakers are really interested in, you know, if they're going to invest time or money or policy in something, they want some kind of reassurance that they're making a decision based on good evidence. So we're trying to articulate a way of thinking about this for qualitative research and qualitative synthesis. Um, and just also to say, if you are interested in methods, the Cochrane Qualitative and Implementation Methods Group exists. There's a web page. Um, James and I are both members. And um, they keep, there's a database of methodological papers, which is quite useful. Um, there's also a just mail discussion list called Ask Us. Again, provides quite a lot of information about method and new papers coming out about qualitative evidence synthesis. If you're into Twitter, uh, the Cochrane Qualitative Methods Group um, 
addresses at the top, and there's also an epicenter one for more general systematic review stuff, Quantan Qual, and um, James and I both have personal accounts as well that we use for, for work-related issues. So um, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. I'll leave that up. Um, thank you very much. I know it's a real whistle-stop tour. <laughs>